Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonas Fischer. I coordinate the uh, visiting programs in the FAO here at OIS. And you might have noticed that we have called for applications open. So if you have any friends that might want to come to OIS, like Sebastiano, or if you want to um, propose a program, which is an entirely new part of the program, then let me know and we can talk about it. But today is, of course, Sebastiano Nicolosso Golo's talk. He will talk about sub Riemannian geometry is everywhere, which I did not know, but let's see. <laughs> I'm just going to introduce him for a very short bit, and then he will start his talk, and we have Q&A after. So he is a postdoc in mathematics at the University of Uskala <laughs> in Finland. Sorry that I didn't pronounce that right. No, he works on the interface between metric analysis and Lie group theory. He has worked in sub Riemannian geometry and later expanded his interest to geometric measure theory on Lie groups equipped with non Riemann distances. He completed his PhD also at the same university. Okay, so I'm looking forward to your talk. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, welcome everybody here. And uh, thank you very much. So, I have to thank very much uh, OIST uh, and all the the program, the, the TVSP program, uh, to allow me to come here in Okinawa to have this great experience. And uh, I really like this institute and I really like the fact that there is such a, uh, that I feel pushed to interact with different uh, sectors of science. Um, and, and this is, and my talk wants to go in that direction. I want to just, just have a, a, um, a like a loose, let's say a loose um, presentation for an overall audience, um, trying to trying to um, capture your curiosity and and because I think I really so subrimanian geometry as a geometry is something that actually comes from control theory and uh, uh, it's really uh, spreading in, in in a lot of applications and uh, we will see some of them. Some are theoretical and some are very practical. Um, yes, so I, I titled my, my talk Sub Riemannian Geometry is Everywhere with a, with a uh, what do you call that? Uh, extra, extra, exclamation mark, and which is maybe not very scientific, and uh, uh, but, um, but you will see that probably I'm right. So, so. Okay, I will show you some models. Okay, let's see. Uh, so uh, just just the first model is a bit stupid. It's almost a joke, but but it would be um, useful later to just understand the second model and all what follows. So let's take, make a model, scientific model of a point in space. Right? It doesn't make much sense, but a point in space is a point in space. So we have three coordinates, x and y and z, and those coordinates, the, the, the three numbers, determine the completely where the point is in space. And then usually points move around. They like a lot to go from A to B. So these points goes also from A to B, and usually points go from A to B in a straight line, because that is, that is the shortest line, right? But it's not really necessary, it could, could go along any path from A to B. So we have a point given by three coordinates and it moves around quite freely and there is a shortest path, path that is the straight line. So the next example is the monocycle. This is very typical in control theorems of Riemannian geometry. So I'm not able to, I'm not, um, I, I tried once to go with a monocycle and I didn't go very far. So I will keep this imaginary monocycle with my heart. Okay. And, uh, and the, to the, the, my description of the monocycle is that it has, uh, it is somewhere on the plane, so it has two coordinates, x and y, and then it has a direction, which is given by an angle, theta. For me, angles are actually elements of S1 of the circle. Uh, so this S1 is the circle in the plane. So the monocycle is given by two coordinates and a direction. And uh, well, the monocycle cannot move completely. Hmm? 
because uh, because it cannot slide sideways. Right? If you're pointing in this direction, you cannot go uh, sideways. Otherwise, you fold. So you can only go uh, back and forth, or you can rotate. And these are the two allow allowed directions. I call it F for forward. Okay, and that is a tangential. I mean, it's in the direction which we are pointing. So given theta is cos cos theta, the same theta, sine theta. And then, and then you can. Well, I, I I'm holding it with my hands. I can I can turn it. So then the second admissible direction is theta. And now the question is, okay, can I go from A to B? Now A to B are not just points in the plane, but are points in the phase space. So uh, which are all points x, y, theta, okay? Which is like R3, like before. So we have a point in a 3D space, and we want it to go from A to B, but now it cannot go, probably, it cannot go in a straight line, because there is one direction that is forbidden, right? The orthogonal direction. And, um, well, you can imagine that it can go, you, you know, it can go everywhere, and we, we we can do it with a picture. So if this is my the, the monocycle seen from above, and I want to move it somehow in in the in the forbidden direction, right? And how do I do? Well, I can um, just just I can I can turn, right? This is one way. I can turn by some angle theta. Then I can go forward. And then I can turn again, probably minus theta, and then I can go backwards. Right? So the 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 the, um, the algorithm they say is to go to rotate for some angle, then go forward, then rotate back and go forward back, so go backwards. And uh, and uh, a composition of these three four movements is basically a commutator. This is where, so in mathematics then, this is what we do. We take this commutator, the Lie brackets of two vector fields, and uh, which is, uh, okay, and now I'm talking a bit for mathematicians, so, but the, I'm deriving basically the cos theta that becomes a sine theta, and they have the cos, the minus sine, and cos sine theta becomes cos theta, okay. And this is and look and this is exactly the forbidden direction. Okay, this is this is the orthogonal direction to f. So this means so Lie brackets is what allows us to uh, get the forbidden direction. Uh, okay, and this is this is very. Uh, this is a theorem actually, and it's called the uh, uh, Chow theorem or Chow theorem, depends on which mistake you want to do. And uh, um, um, and this condition, which is like uh, you can attain all uh, forbidden direction using Lie brackets, is called Lie bracket generated condition or Cho condition, Chao condition, or um, uh, Hormander condition as well. Um, let me see where we are. Um, Yeah, right. So, and this is the this the so uh, we have the phase. So we have the space of all configurations. In the space of all configuration, we have admissible directions, and then we have this condition that allow that gives us controllability. So we can fully control the system, not going into straight lines, right? Like for the point in the three three D space, but taking some more complicated uh, algorithm, we can actually go from A to B, from any A to any B in the phase space. And this is controllability. Another example, uh, oh yeah, this was for pictures. You can you can then work out also what happens for the for a bicycle, right? With just two two wheels. And uh, and then here I just try to write down the equations that um, so in this case we have some controls. In this case, it's, it's, it's clearer what are the controls. So I can I can go forward and maybe also backward, um, and that is the s that is here, is the speed, and then I can control the angle. I can turn alpha. So 
when I on the bike, I have control on S and alpha. And then the bike will satisfy, so the F and B are the front wheel and the back wheel, and they satisfy this equation. So when I cycle, I have control on alpha and S, and then I want, through this control, I want to move the, the, the bike, so the front and the back wheel, around in space. So, yeah, this is, and this is also controllable. Um, Another typical example, which is um, even for more complicated, but the idea is always the same, is with the car that you know probably pretty well. So now a car is different from a motorcycle or for a bicycle because it has four wheels and you can turn only the two wheels in front, right? And, but uh, the idea is still the same. You can, can you have two controls, so you can turn the wheel, the, the steering wheel, or you can go back and forth. So you have two controls, but you're moving around in a 3D space, right? which is not this 3D space, but it's the three-dimensional space of all configuration. And so, for instance, when, you're, uh, when you want to park a car and, and you're in this situation, then uh, you, want, you need to do a parallel parking. So in principle, you are not allowed to go down straight like that, but you know that with some complicated uh, algorithm, you can actually go there. So with two controls, we are with, yeah, with two controls, we are steering a system that has three degree of freedom. And uh, things get even more complicated if, if you are driving a, a truck and then with uh, maybe a trailer uh, or maybe with a second and third trailer trailers, and then and then this this is then uh, we go into the like, really practical applications. There are really softwares that help drivers to drive long um, uh, trailers. And, uh, and you can basically park it everywhere if you have enough space. Um, so let's do a summary of this first part of the talk. We have said that we have, for, for all these models, we have a space of configurations. It's like how this, all these configurations of a system. And this is usually a high dimensional space. And But then we have only a few rules of, we have some rules for movement. So we have only a few controls. So the number of controls is smaller than the degree of freedom, degrees of freedom. And then what we check using Lee brackets usually, and uh, is the controllability of the system. So with the, even though we have less controls, we can still steer the system from A to B. And, uh, and then there are uh, additional questions. Of course, once you know that you can, then you have to find a way to steer the, the system from A to B, which is not, it's not, a, you, you, it's, it's, it's not easy to implement. And, um, Usually you want it to do with a software, so you need a theoretical tool to go through it. And then, uh, uh, and then usually you want, it, you want to do it also optimally. So in the sense that you have probably a cost function that you want to minimize. It can be time, can be energy or fuel consumption or anything, Speed or yeah, distance. And, um, uh, yeah, because just an example, if you want to park your car, like do a, uh, parallel parking, uh, you know that if you go like a few centimeters forward, then you turn a little bit and then you turn a little bit, you can go a few centimeters like on, on the right. right. And then, of course, you can just repeat it this thousands time and then you can move meters. On, on the right, but that's probably not what you want to do when you are in a crowded city. You want to do it with a one smooth movement. And uh, and here is where Sabri Manager comes. So yeah, I'm cheating a little bit because what I'm talking about is actual control theory, but uh, I am a geometer and what I see in this control, in these models is the Sabri Manager geometry, which is the phase space with now a cost function and from, when we go from A to B, we want to minimize the cost function, and this gives us a distance. So I have a, a geometrical space. And, uh, and uh, as a geometer, I want to study the geometry of this phase space in W with a cost function. 
And we will see towards the end, which will be probably the punchline of the whole talk, uh, how the, why geometry could be important. Uh, for now, the only geometrical object that we see is this, that the optimality, so finding an optimal path, an optimal strategy, geometrically means finding a geodesic from A to B. Let's go on with some other examples. I like this one. This is very old example. It's rolling a sphere on a plane. So imagine you have a sphere, imagine like, like uh, a planet. So you see all the continents or something like that. And then, um, and then and you, you roll the sphere on the floor and you want to roll it uh, without, uh, um, without sliding and without uh, spinning. And uh, again, uh, what is the phase space? In this case, we have a, uh, the, so the, the, the ball, the sphere in space is described by where it touches the plane, so the x, y coordinates, and how it is oriented in space, which is a rotation, so an element of SO3. And uh, so space of configuration is x, y, and a rotation, which is an element of SO3. And um, so without slipping or spinning, uh, these are our, so uh, let's go so, um, in order. So the space of configuration has dimension five. So R2 has dimension two and SO3 has dimension uh, three and SO3 at least the Lie algebra. So it's generated by these three infinitesimal rotations, which are the infinitesimal like I X is a matrix, but is the rotation around the X axis and uh, I Y is the rotation around the Y axis and I D is the rotation around the Z axis. And uh, uh, these three, is the infinitesimal version rotations, uh, generate all the rotations. And um, so SO3 at dimension three, the phase space at dimension five, and we have now two controls because what we can do with the ball, we can, we can just, uh, we can uh, roll it either like along X or along Y, I mean, on, along, on the plane, so in two dimensions. And, uh, and the two conditions, the two allowed directions are these two, X and Y. Uh, now I talk maybe more to mathematicians. What, here what it means is that I can move along X, the, uh, the X, part of a factor. And when, but when I move along X, I have to rotate. So uh, I imagine here that I, I plug in my ball from the right. So R is a rotation. So this is the, the initial ball I plug in from the right. Then I apply R, so it gets that the ball where I am is like this. And, this. and then uh, if I move along X, the ball we start rotate in in along the the um, along the now maybe here there's a mistake along the Y axis. Ah, yes, it's correct, yeah? yeah, I was correct. So then it starts rotating along the y-axis like this, yeah? and, uh, and it's kind of quantitative, because after time one, here it did uh, pi of, um, a half, yes, a quarter of a rotation, so it had, if the radius of the ball is r, then it went pi r divided by two meter on, on the, along the x-axis. And, uh, and similarly for the other one. So we have two expressions, these matrices, et cetera. And then, and then we can do the Lie bracket and one starts computing, blah, blah, blah. These are matrices, so somehow one should be able to do it. Uh, this, uh, I call it mathematical yoga, you just go down and you check that at the end you get one, two, three, four, five vectors that are linearly independent. So this total space is five dimensional, so we get all directions. So this system is controllable. Even the sphere here and the sphere there in any orientation, I can go from here to there uh, just by rolling the sphere somehow. And um, yeah, let's see, uh, even a more complicated um, 
this is a slightly com more complicated example is when I want to roll, forget about the plane, I want to roll a ball, a sphere over another sphere. So the rule is always the same without slipping and, and twist, um, um, twisting or whatever. And I drew this uh, plane just to suggest you, if you want to get the equations here, you can go back to the previous example because you, you have two balls that they, and ball, both balls are rolling on a plane and uh, their rolling is linked to each other. Anyway, we focus on the two balls. So then we have that the phase space in this case is SO3 times SO3, so all rotations of one and all rotation of the other. Now the dimension is six. And uh, we still have only two directions, and uh, so two controls. And, uh, and again, we can do this mathematical yoga and compute all these brackets. And at this point, uh, there is a twist uh, in the story, because if you look at that, if R and S are equal, yeah, there should be a minus and a plus, anyway. Uh, if R and S are equal, then, um, I don't see it because I'm too close to it. But two vectors that are, um, are uh, becomes the same as the previous ones. Yeah. So these two are equal, and and uh, if R and S are equal, they become proportional to the first one. Okay. And also compute a determinant if you want. But and so uh, what happens is that if R and S are equal, these Lie brackets and then iteratively also all the other Lie brackets are not able to span six dimensions. So the system is not controllable. So if you have two spheres and that are of the same radii, then you cannot control. So you cannot go from A to B in this case. But if R and S are different, then or suddenly you can control it. And, and there is also another uh, example where you put a sphere inside another sphere. So there a smaller sphere that is rolling uh, inside the other sphere. So it's an interesting exercise, yoga exercise. All right, so there are more, then more and more examples that you can find in literature. And uh, for instance, in, I know in quantum mechanics, I didn't find uh, I didn't find exactly an example that I I, yeah, I met a few years ago. But okay, um, I wouldn't have time anyway. Um, uh, but okay, in quantum mechanics, you can imagine that you have probably a quantum system and you have control over certain quantities and you want to steer the quantum system from A to B, and uh, uh, and this is in particular. I, I, there's something that they try to do, they do, or they do it at least theoretically in quantum computing, where you have these qubits that I have no idea what they are, but you want to control them. And, uh, and also in thermodynamics, that's actually a very old theory. And that's where um, it's one of the first, maybe the first um, con um, examples in control theory that was made already by Kara Theodori. And uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, I think. And, uh, and from that theory comes, for instance, a very important name in Subramanian geometry, which is Carnot, which is the Carnot from thermodynamics. And, um, uh, with, and in, in Subramanian geometry, we have Carnot groups, which are actually the infinitesimal models of all Subramanian geometry. And now, now I want to present you another example, which is now of a different type, even though then we end up with the same general framework. And it's a falling car. So this is a very old, uh, it's actually a, a mo movie. And uh, it's like the first movie where a cat is appearing. This is Wikipedia says. And um, so they, they let a cat fall. And you know that a cat falls always on its legs. And that's quite amazing. Uh, I never tried it because I'm very scared of it. And also my cat was very scared, so we didn't do it. But it seems that you can do it and you can find many videos. So, but what is going on? 
uh, if you look at it naively, you say, okay, he's smart. But let's be a bit more intelligent and think that uh, the cut is starting without angular momentum, with zero angular momentum, and during the fall is free falling, and it is at the end it's, uh, it, uh, it's ma it made a, a rotation, a full rotation. So it means that it looks like he got some angular momentum, and we know that at the end it has to in physics angular momentum is always conserved. So where does it come from? And uh, well, it cannot come from air because the drag of air is too small to uh, get so much. And, uh, and the cat is not a bird. Hmm? And the cat knows it because it understood it when he was on the top of the tree, that he was not a bird. And it was too late. And uh, so it's not a bird, so it cannot fly and it cannot get this angular momentum from the air. So where does it get from? Get it from, and it cannot break the rules of physics. So actually, it's not getting any angular momentum. And what he's doing is something very smart. So what he's doing is changing his shape, and you can see it. And uh, I cannot draw a cut, so I drew this this three cans, uh, which is a model of the cut. So you have the, the center of the body and the two sides, of the two parts, ends of the body, more or less. And uh, and what the cat can do is is it can while flying it can change the shape in this way. So first it bends like like this, and then and then it, at that point it can basically rotate the two opposite sides. And so this picture is very schematic, but it, it make there is something that becomes very clear that if this part rotates in one on, on one and uh, one direction, the body is all connected. The other part has to rotate on the other direction. And so the total angular momentum is zero. Okay, so it's not breaking the angular momentum because the two parts are rotating, uh, canceling each other. And, uh, and you can also imagine how you could do it. If you were like floating in space, you can, you can using your muscles, your core muscle, you can rotate in this way, right? This is what the cat is doing. And, uh, and uh, well, and then magically at this point, if it goes back, it's facing down. There is was facing up and here is facing down. And uh, a way to describe it is the following. So for each, so this is the space of configurations, which are the cat in space. It has some shape in space and somewhere with some orientation. And, uh, but at, for every uh, configuration of the cut in space, the cut has a shape. The shape is independent from the space, okay? It's just like the abstract shape. Uh, yeah. And uh, you see that and the, at the beginning, it has this shape. And at the end, uh, it has actually the same shape. And between, it's changing shape. So then you have a little bit somewhere between. Okay? So what the cat can do is moving around in this in this the space of shapes can change its shape. And then what we what what we have here in this bigger space of configurations is a lift of the curve from here to there. And basically, this represents the controls, and this represents okay the phase space. But and so it's still this always the same thing, right? But now we see it as a lift. So a curve in the shape space lifts to a curve in the in the in the configuration in the space of configurations, and uh, and uh, and what the cat is doing is is exploiting. I think this is called like this. It's exploiting the non-triviality of the holono holonomy group. So a loop here. So it starts and ends at the same shape, leads to something that is not a loop. Yeah, maybe because I don't know. It's like it's like uh, it's like if you have if you are. So this is the typical. So if you are on, uh, the, take the circle, 
and then above the circle we have this spiral right and then and then if i start here and so i'm here on the spiral and then if i move imaginary i move i, I make one round around the circle on the spiral above what happens is that I go up, so I don't end up in the same spot. And this is exactly the same situation. Very good. Some extra examples that follow more or less the same philosophy is okay, uh, I call them space robots. It's, uh, uh, yeah, imagine like a, a robot floating in space. So it can probably move around and like a cow, but maybe more freely. And another another example are micro spinners, which means uh, like you living things or, or robots that are very small and float in some liquid in water. Like very small means like bacteria, something. Like that. And uh, uh, the, the the what happens is that at that is like the opposite of the cut in the air. Uh, at that scale, drag forces are very strong. And uh, you don't have inertia. So a body floating so small in, in water can, like, if it wants to go to constant speed, has to uh, exert a constant force. And as soon as it stops making any effort, it will stop moving. That's because drag is very strong. It's like the opposite of the car. And um, uh, and the and it, it this is what happens is that. Uh, they, well, many of these um, microorganisms uh, can move around, changing their shape. And there I try to make a picture to explain how that can happen. So if you go from a round ball and then you squeeze yourself into like a saddle, like that, bike saddle, then what happens is that uh, what was the, the uh, I, can I use this one? The no. and um, and I have another one here. Yeah. So the w what I draw here are the 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 water that was here, right? So here there was some water, and now when the 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 this thing changes its shape, this water has to flow here, right? And if the water flow, some water flows there, then the body has a force on the on the opposite direction, so it moves. That's how. It, so then now we want to a control is like we want to understand how to go really from A to B, uh, changing the shape to go there. And there is this book by Richard Montgomery, a tour of subremanian geometries, their geodesics and applications, where you can find most of these examples, and uh, it's a very good book. And it's also quite thin and contains a lot of stuff. Um, another another very interesting example is celestial mechanics, and uh, here uh, very good research is uh, Emmanuel Telat, who works also for the European Space um, uh, Industry, um, and uh, and what he studied in particular is how to move. From, so you have a space capped in space, and when it's nothing is happening, it's just uh, traveling along an orbit. And then you want to change orbit. So you want to go from orbit A to orbit B, and you want to do it maybe in an optimal way, or actually you, you want to be able to do it, which is not very easy. And um, uh, and then you can also do more complicated stuff like traveling from one planet to another one, trying to minimize. Uh, fuel consumption, and there, there, there are very nice theories that yeah shows you how yeah you can almost go around for free in space if you have time. Uh, last example, a bit more complicated. So this is the V1 visual cortex and image reconstruction. Well, let's start with this example. So here you see two pictures, okay? One on the left and one on the right. Now there are these. So uh, this, this on the left is the Kanitsa triangle. 
And uh, if you look at it carefully, what you should see, so the triangle is the one that is inside here, that is covering these three discs. And, uh, but in fact, if you look carefully, there is no triangle there. And the right-hand side picture should help you to understand that. So this nothing happened here, just, they just rotate it. And, but between these discs, you don't see anything. It's just pure white. But between these discs, probably, you should see some line here, right? Sounds crazy. But it is actually like that. I mean, they, they, do, they did experiments. People do see usually a line there, somehow a very faint line, like that whole, the white is changing, like it's darker outside and lighter inside. Yes, that is how I see it. So you are not crazy, we are not crazy. There is like, there is something there. And uh, let's keep it there a moment and let's do the following exercise. So we want, we want to, uh, so I I'll show you how to reconstruct an image that has a hole. So let's start with an image. It's just a gray scale image, okay? And with the gray that is changing so that it has always a non-zero gradient. Now, if you fix a point there, you look at the direction. Well, you can look at the direction where the color changes the most for the gradient, or you can also look at the, the, what I drew there, what I tried to draw there, uh, is the direction where the color remains constant. And basically, this is a boundary. Like in, the, in, the, in that picture, uh, of course, inside the black, it's just black, but in the interface between the black and the white, there is a direction of a change, right? And uh, and we take the tangential direction, right? This, this one. And now we lift it in. So for each point of this of the of the image, we take an S one again. So it's like a, an interval with the two endpoints uh, identified. So it's a circle, and gives us this direction. Okay. So every point in this in the image, we have a direction there. So if you do this for every point, we get a surface in the in a three-dimensional space, which is again, um, let's see if I do it, R3, R2 times S1. And uh, so here, this is more or less the scheme. If we have a start with the picture, it's actually the same, and you see the, the, the lines where the color remains constant. And now we lift it into this R2 times S1, right? So then we get a surface there that describes the picture. And now, and now, well, now there was a hole, and we didn't know what to do there. But uh, when you see a surface, it kind, kind of it's, it's easier to think what you can put there, like just fill the hole of the surface. Right? And uh, but now this new surface should actually describe an, uh, some grayscale color. It is actually a quite interesting procedure because, okay, I didn't show it here. You can imagine, for instance, if you see, if you see from above uh, a highway, highway with some bridges, and then the highway crosses another highway, right? If you see it from above, what you see is that the lines of the of the roads, at a certain point, some road gets interrupted, and uh, if you, and and the bridges of the highway are actually like the same type of lift in certain sense into the three-dimensional space. So then, then when you see it uh, from above, you don't understand what is going on. So it is like a, a cause. But then when you, when you see in three dimension, you see that there's one road that goes up and one road that goes below. And you can complete the road below, right? Go straight. That's very useful because it's used uh, to build up algorithms that, um, that are used what, to study the, um, like the veins, so the, the blood circulation in the retina, okay? um, that is linked to some illnesses. And, and what you want to do is like have an, a, a computer program that gives you, the, give, you give it the picture of, this, of the retina, which is something you should imagine like a bit reddish with these veins that cross each other. And it should be able to understand if the um, 
to distinguish different veins when they cross. Right? This is more or less where you get it. And uh, okay, how to fill this? The, the, there are many ways to fill this hole, and uh, but we apply this principle, and it's like this. There's like a propagation of the information. It means the following: suppose that we are here, this blue dot, okay, and. Uh, there is no violet, so the violet is in the hole, but we have this black line. So we know that up to now, this was the boundary, or this was the, the, the line of uh, constant color. And uh, what can happen next? So one thing is that it can go straight, continuous straight line, or maybe it can change direction, but it would not change direction completely in an, um, all of a sudden. It should change direction maybe more smoothly, right? like this, as I drew there. And um, okay, so if I am one pixel, and then there is another person that makes another pixel, and here between us there is a hole, and I see uh, I have a line here, straight line, and they have also a straight line there. And then I say, look, here I have a straight line, so probably we go in this direction, like, like this, and the other one says, ah. Oh, I go in this direction and then we meet also good so then we can we can say that between us there is a straight line or maybe there is a line that that bends a little bit like that and that's how we want to, to so we we propagate the information on the whole along these these curves and if we look it now up up in the lift what it, what it means is that now we are in the point x y there and with some direction and from there, we can go either with the same direction. Now, yeah, now the height is the direction. So we go there, we go to another direction, etc. And so these are the two directions of propagation of the information. And should ring you a bell, because I wrote, already uh, wrote these two vector fields at the beginning of the, of the seminar. And for the monocycle, they are exact, this is exactly the same geometry of the monocycle. But remember there we were interested in basically in geodesics, so it's minimizing curves. Now we are interested in surfaces, actually minimizing surfaces. And we do the, we fill the hole. I mean, they fill the hole because they didn't do it, but there are some papers out there and they do it using, uh, for instance, the, the, the heat flow, that the propagation of the information. And that's where now geometry, some Riemannian geometry comes into the game because we we, uh, we really want to understand these spaces. And for instance, we want to study the heat equation, uh, whatever it means using these two, these vector fields and, and the intrinsic geometry of the, of the space. No, I'm sorry. Um, what comes next? Uh, this is an example of an image reconstruction. Um, so above, okay, it's a picture, and then they just made a mess with it, it's taken away a lot of data. And then we, there is just a computer program that fills in the, the, the holes. And yeah, there are even more striking examples, but I didn't find it yesterday. And um, but it can, I think it's really quite amazing because it's just a computer program, an algorithm. It's like a heat flow, and, and then you get that. And not only, so this is just some image reconstructions, but uh, the inspiration of that model comes really more or less from the study of the brain. So the V1 cortex, cortex, cortex which is like a part of the brain here in the back. And it's one of the first uh, uh, process of, Oh, this is um, one of the first moments in the image process, process of, of what we see, right? There, are, there, are, there is the V1, there is the V2, V3, I don't know. So then, then the, the image processing in our brain is very complicated. And one, this is one of the first things that happens. And it really tries, so the brain tries to find contours and complete them. And this is an, a picture there. What should, so, um, the idea is that above every point, let's say, or pixel of the retina, you should have a column of neurons, and that, that and and on the column of neurons, uh, 
one of the neurons get excited when, so every neuron in the column has a preferred direction. And when the contour has that direction at that point, that neuron gets excited. And then, uh, and then when it gets excited, it tries to excite other neurons uh, around following the two directions of before, right? And that's how in the brain then you get this flow of information inside the brain. But then actually, in the in the brain, the, these these columns are not really all columns, but they are flat down. So that's why of this picture. So different color um, correspond to different directions, and this is a map. And I think this this was made really experimentally. Like you you take a person and you show from a picture with a line, and you see some parts that are more active than others and changing the direction, you see these parts changing. So you can make a map which neurons are excited by what direction, by which direction. And um, so no, no, I don't have it here anymore, but if we go back to, to this one, yeah, this is what is happening. And it is at least one explanation. So here the brain is recognizing this, uh, border, this uh, contour, and then there is like this automatic system that tries to feel it, right? and tries to feel it here very sharp, and then it, the information loses strength, so then here is a bit not so sharp, but then here is also sharp, and they meet in the between. There are even more examples, more complicated, where you really see that the brain uh, finds lines in a very messy picture. Uh, just because it's like does this this process. So you see, yeah, I find it amazing because the line is not there, but you see it. You truly see it. It's really real perception. It's not they call it illusion, but it's a perception. So I think this is the end of it. Thank you very much. Questions or remarks, please. Ah, maybe you you they want you to use a microphone. Uh, where do you ask? Why do you have this word "sub" in front of this submarine man? Sub, what, sub, yeah, sub. What, what what is "sub" about? This? Ah, yeah, okay. The "sub" is about the fact that the number of, number of controls is less the dimension of the phase of the configuration space. So if the, you have as many controls as the dimension of the configuration space, which means like the, the very first example I gave of the point in space, then that is like Riemannian geometry. But now if you have less control, then you have sub Riemannian geometry. Yeah. Mathematically, it means that you will have like a, a Riemann tensor, like a, a metric tensor, but it's not defined on the old tangent bundle, but only on a sum bundle. That is a very important thing I should have said. Thank you very much. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so in Riemannian geometry, you have a geodesic equation which is gives you like a geodesic flow on the tangent bundle. Now that doesn't work in the sub Riemannian setting, but then you have a Hamiltonian approach to it. So you get an Hamiltonian and the difference, so the, 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 the Riemannian Hamiltonian is not much different from the, from the, from the scalar product itself, the quadratic form, but, but the, the sub Riemannian Hamiltonian has now a, a, a single asset at zero in basically in the, in the non-admissible direction of your foot. Yeah, and that's the singularity, yeah. So you, sh but be careful. So you can uh, get most of geodesics using the, I mean, this Hamiltonian approach, but not everyone, not every geodesic. And that's like a big open problem in several geometry because there are these geodesics that are called singular or, strictly have normal geodesics 
that do not come from the Hamiltonian theory. And uh, I mean, yeah, because they, are, yeah, they don't come from that. So we, we don't know, we don't even know if they are smooth. Uh, well, first, thanks for the talk. Uh, when you said that, for example, that you find that these equations in a real system, and then that you want to understand the the geometry, what do you mean by understanding the geometry? What what does it mean? I'm I'm not a mathematician, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um... So the geometry of the space is really is. is it's so everything and nothing. So uh, uh, here in this talk, maybe I, I try to show two things. Why is here yeah, finally? And two two um, two uh, cases. So you can look at geodesics. So minimizing curves. And uh, and when you look at geodesics, then it means I want to know, uh, given two points, how many geodesics there are, uh, if they are smooth, if if they satisfy some PDE, some ODE that I can solve, and um, uh, when they meet, and what happens when they meet, and uh, uh, yeah, and then and then uh, they be using the geodesic and this minimizing cost that you get the distance between two points. So you want to so probably you cannot compute explicitly the distance. But you want to have an estimate of the distance from above or from below, more or less, asymptotically or something like that. And uh, so this is more or less for like like the path geometry. But then we have also like this surface geometry, or where then we want to understand what is the area, for instance, of a of a of a surface, and what does it mean to minimize that area. Or in more in PDEs, we can have uh, this like the heat flow, which should I mean if you think of it like we, now maybe the path geometry is quite clear by now, but and then and then you can um, do a Brownian motion, uh, heuristically a Brownian motion using only the the, the allowed uh, uh, directions, and then you should get at the end a, a, a heat kernel in this case, but and this heat kernel should have also a PDE. Uh, with a with a with a Laplacian or something that works like a Laplacian, and um, and so then you want to know if there exists a uh, heat kernel, what is his uh, uh, regularity, what are its estimates, um, the decay or things like that, and you can study also the wave equation and, and just the Laplace equation and so on. Um, yeah, this is the geometry. And, and usually, this is a trend of the last 40 years now. Every year is, gets longer. But, and uh, it's try to boil down everything to the distance. Because what mathematicians understood is that most of the analysis that you do, like mathematical analysis, like derivatives, integrals, PDEs, is something that what you really need is just the distance between points, not for everything, but for most qualitative properties. You only need to know, to know the distance, right? So, so one tries tries really to make like a very abstract theory using only the distance. And, um, how could I somehow get a hint that if I'm studying something, there, if I'm studying something, a system, whatever it is, how could I get a hint that oh, there might be a sub Riemannian geometry here? I should call you and ask you for help. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just call me and ask me. Because maybe it's not a Subramanian geometry, but but I could still help, okay. or maybe not, and then I tell you. Oh, probably one one thing is that if you have a a space that is bigger than the number of controls, probably this is. Yeah. Is other questions? There's a question from the Zoom chat. Um, so amateur question, from falling cat space of shapes, is it possible to simulate human bipedal walking? 
yeah, I, I probably, yeah, if I, uh, yeah, probably this is what they also do, right? So walking is a, is, can be seen as a control problem in the same way. So now think of me like floating in the space, I can change my shape, okay, as I want. And then, the, uh, and then I put, and then I, I, I make a strategy and then I put myself on the ground and I see what happens when I, I do this strategy, right? And see how far I go. So, and then, um, and then I would like to go, um, go very fast, and, uh, and and so then I try to optimize my my movement. I'm changing just my shape. I'm not I'm moving my shape space, and uh, but uh, but then my movement in the shape space is translating into a movement into the space. Yeah, that's exactly the same thing as the cup falling. And the whole on me walk. Right. Hmm. Other questions? I have one more from Zoom. Mm -hmm. Has any study been done when the face space is fractal? Ah, um, yeah. So, what does it mean, fractal? So, who, uh, I have to say. Usually, usually, uh, for me, fractal means that. But I, I use the word fractal to say that the house of dimension, which is like the metric dimension, the the, the dimension of the metric space, is different from the topological dimension. Topological dimension is just like the, the the very basic dimension of where you are. So all the dimensions that I stated here are topological. Right? The, the dimension of this SO3, SO3 is six. But now if we take these two uh, directions, these two controls and the sub-Riemannian geometry uh, implied by that on that space, SO3 cross SO3, now we get a metric space and the house of dimension there is uh, 10, I think. Um, it's 10. So actually, that subrimanian manifold, that subrimanian space is a factor for me. Then probably the question was not really this about this. It was more like, uh, uh, well, then. Like like uh, if the phase space instead of SO3 cos SO3 you have a uh, a fun 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 Koch curve or um, something like that and uh, no I don't know I don't know I know nothing about it I tried to give the answer to the question that I for which I knew the answer yeah. Thank you. So, any other questions? Okay, if not, then I think we thank the speaker. Thank you very much, Sebastiano, and give him a round of applause. Thank you very much.